the last one, one we skipped over, we have analog data like my voice or music, but we want to send it as digital signals. And what we'll do, in fact, is, and it's very common nowadays, is instead of trying to send it as analog data, the common technique is to convert that analog data into digital data, digitize that data. So we take our analog data, convert it to digital data, zeros and ones, and then transmit it as a digital signal. If we have digital data, we know how to send digital signals. We've had the te techniques already. And in fact, if we convert the analog data into digital data, we can also send it using analog signals, using shift key. So the approach here in this last one is, how do we convert the analog data into digital data? And you do that or you uh, see it in, in practice uh, probably every day because what your mobile phone does when you talk to it, you've got analog data as input, the phone converts that into a digital form, into zeros and ones, your voice, and then that's sent across the phone network, in fact using analog signals with a mobile phone, uh, uh, digital signals. So we're going to focus on the conversion process, analog to digital data. How do we digitize the analog data? And the thing that does that, or the process is called encoding, and the, the opposite process is decoding. So the thing we, that does this digi digitizing of the analog data we call a codec. In this course we'll consider just one. A very basic technique called pulse code modulation. But there are many other codecs. Anyone know others? Other codecs? We'll go through PCM. What are some others? Has anyone listened to music before on a computer? Mm. Right. What format? Music is, in, is originally analog, but when we save it on our computer, what format do we use? WMV, WMA, Windows Media Audio, MP3, uh, FLAC, and many other formats, they involve specifying how to convert the analog data, the music, the audio, and convert it to bits so we can save it on our computer. That's all we're doing here, but PCM is the, the very basic approach. The ones that we mentioned, MP3 and so on, uh, may, may have some additional features. So let's look at PCM. And I'll briefly explain it, but then for the detail we'll go through an example. The picture may not be so useful at this stage. There are really uh, well, four steps which we'll go through via example. We have analog data as input. It covers a range of amplitudes, an infinite number of amplitudes. It's analog means it's continuously changing the amplitude. What we do is we split the, from the maximum to minimum into a discrete level of amplitudes. We break it into a discrete number of levels. That's the first step and each of those levels, each of those amplitudes will assign a code number like level 0, level 1, level 2, level 255. We'll see that through an example. Then over time, if you think of the horizontal axis, over time we take samples of the input analog data. Every so often we record the actual input level from the first step, find out what that level is, <coughs> and that level becomes a number it's got a special name in, in, in PCM, a PAM value. And once we have a number, an integer, we can represent that in binary. And that's the last bit. We get an n-bit binary number, a code, and that's our digital data. So the key concept is we, we're going to divide our amplitude into a discrete number of levels. Then we're going to take discrete set of samples over time. And each sampled value 
will correspond to one of the levels which will map to a binary number and that gives us our digital data. So to illustrate that we'll go through an example which is not in these lecture slides but if you flick forward a few pages you'll find another handout on PCM. Move forward on your handouts and you'll find it. This one. It's just a bit more detailed example of PCM, pulse code modulation. A very simple, unrealistic example, but one we can follow through. <coughs> Everyone's found it? Okay. So here's our input analog data. This is what we want to send to our receiver. And the way that we're going to send it is we're going to digitize it. We're going to convert the analog data into digital data, zeros and ones. So it's just some made up analog data. Over time you can see the amplitude is varying, continuously changing. So let's put some scale to that for this example. All right, there's an amplitude and, and the horizontal axis is time. And I put some numbers on here so we can do some calculations. We say that this scale, just for this short period of time, the analog data may keep going, but for this example, goes up to about 18 milliseconds. So this is, think of it, someone talking for 18 milliseconds. We want to take that audio and convert it to zeros and ones. How do we do it with PCM? The first thing we do is we divide the amplitude into a discrete number of levels usually the same width, the same height, the same height in terms of amplitude. And in this example, for the first case, I chose eight levels. So we've got eight levels, so I'm going to label them zero to seven. So the, the way to interpret this picture now is that uh, from the, the bottom solid line to the first dash line corresponds to level zero and above the top dash line corresponds to level 7. So we have 8 levels here. And in this case we're going to set a sampling interval of 4 milliseconds. That means every 4 milliseconds I'm going to record a sample of the input analog data. Let's do that. We'll start at time 0. So you think what I do, I have this input data, I record at time 0 what is the actual level? And we measure this value, whatever it is, maybe it's 1.134 volts. And I map it to the, one of the discrete levels that I have def defined in, at the start. So in this case, the way to read it, instead of trying to me tell you what the actual voltage or the signal strength is, we just realize that at this point, the signal is in level 1. If it fell in this range, it would be level 0, up here level 2. But in this case, it falls in the range for level 1. So the level, what we sometimes call the code number, is 1. And now let's convert that to binary. So we have decimal integers for the levels. Let's convert it to binary. And because we have 8 levels, let's convert it to a 3-bit number, 0, 0, 1. So 1 in decimal, 0, 0, 1 in binary. Why 3 bits? Well, if we're going to have 8 levels, we need 3 bits to represent any of those 8 numbers from 0 to 7. Think of this as simply 0, 0, 0 up to 1, 1, 1. We could use 4 bits, but it would be a waste. To represent 8 numbers, we don't need 4 bits, we only need 3 bits. And it turns out, we'll see shortly, we want to use as few bits as possible. 2 is not enough, of course, we can only represent 4 numbers with 2 bits. That's why I get a 3-bit uh, value here. This is the sampled value. And then, with a sampling interval of 4 milliseconds, at time 4, we do it again. 
I, at this point in time, I measure what the value is here, the actual value, and I see it falls within the range of level 6. So we convert that to a 3-bit number and we get 1106. And we keep doing that. And we get another three samples. And we get a sequence of 15 bits. This is our digitized analog data. So we've converted our analog data, the blue line, into 15 bits, in this case, into our digital data. And those bits would be sent to the receiver. Or if it's, uh, say, for music and you want to save it on your computer, maybe saved on the hard drive. Any questions on how PCM works at this stage? Discrete number of levels. The number needs to be defined. In this example, I chose eight levels. And a sampling interval. In this case, I chose a four millisecond sampling interval. We take measurements of the input analog data at each sample point, And that corresponds to one of those eight levels and we get a 3-bit binary number for each sample. Then we send those bits to the receiver using whichever technique we want to. We have digital data, we can use digital signals or analog signals. Let's look at what the receiver does. The receiver receives these 15 bits. You can think it receives 3 bits at a time. At time zero, the transmitter generated 001 and then sends it to the receiver. The receiver receives 001. Then it will shortly later, at four milliseconds, receive 110, 011, and so on. What does the receiver do? The receiver is going to receive those bits and then try to generate that same data, the analog data. And this is what it generates. Think when the receiver receives the first three bits at relative to, at, from the receiver's perspective at time zero, it receives zero, zero, 001 or level one. So what it does is produces an analog output at level one for four milliseconds because our sampling interval is 4 milliseconds. It holds that level for a fixed duration. Then at time 4, the receiver receives another 3 bits, 1, 1 0, level 6. So it produces an output at level 6. Then at 3, 1, and 2. I didn't finish the picture here. So this is the analog output at the receiver. It's, as you see, an approximation of the input at the transmitter. What we'll call the reproduced data at the destination or the receiver. So let's compare them. The blue line is the analog input. The green line is the analog output. One example may be the blue line is your voice when you're talking on your mobile phone. And the green line is produced by the speaker at, the f at your friend's mobile phone. That is the speaker on the phone at the receiver. As it receives the bits, it produces some analog output. But it's not continuous because all it receives is these bits every four milliseconds. So all it does is holds the level for a period of time. Of course, they're not the same but you may see that the green line is sort of following the blue line. It's low at the start, it goes up to a peak and then slowly comes down a bit and then goes up a bit at the end. What we care about is how close that green line is to the blue one. We can think that's a measure of quality of the, the analog output. In terms of audio, how good it sounds. We'd like to get as close as possible to the original input when we reproduce it at the receiver. How can we get closer 
I want to get the received analog output, the green line, closer to the blue one. What can we do? Yeah? Multiply the level of amplitude, supply, number of Right. So we've got two options. We can change the number of levels that we have here. Here we chose eight. And or we can change how often we sample. The other two parameters of our, uh, our codec in this case, PCM. I said in our case it was four milliseconds and eight levels. Let's go through three other cases with different values. And we'll plot them and, and you'll hopefully visually see the difference between them. So let's do case two. Still with eight levels, but now we use a two millisecond sampling interval. Every two milliseconds we take a sample, convert it to a three bit number. It's three bits because we still have eight levels. We get twice as many samples. Half the sampling interval. We transmit those 30 or so bits to the receiver. When the receiver receives those bits, every two milliseconds it produces an output at the, the designated level. So 0, 0, 001 for two milliseconds, and then at three for two milliseconds, and then at four, uh, six, and so on. And this is what we get. For two milliseconds we hold the level at one, then at three for two milliseconds, then at six for two plus another two because there are two sequences of six received, then at three and so on. What we will do at the end is I'll compare the different cases. So this is comparing the, for case two the input data and the output data. Maybe you can see it's a little bit closer to the blue line. But let's go through two more cases and then I'll show all of them overlapping on each other. We can change the number of levels. Here I use a two millisecond sampling interval. Every two milliseconds take a sample. But use 16 levels. 0 to 15. And with 16 levels, every sample must map to a 4-bit number. Because we need 4 bits to represent any of those 16 values. From 0, 0, 0, 0 up to 4 ones for 15. So every 2 milliseconds, we generate 4 bits. And those bits indicate the level. We transmit those bits to the receiver and the receiver will generate hold for two milliseconds, the output at that particular level. And it becomes this. It's hard to compare with the other one. We'll do it shortly. One last case. One millisecond sampling interval. 16 levels, so we've just reduced the sampling interval even further. We have four bits per sample, but now every one millisecond we record a sample. So many bits are transmitted. This is what we get at the receiver when we reproduce that uh, analog data. And I'll try and show all four at once, plus the input analog data. It's not easy to see because some of them overlap. And I haven't, uh, you can't see some are behind others. But first, the blue line is the input. That's what we want. But what we're doing by taking discrete number of levels and discrete samples is we're approximating that. And the red line and you don't see much of it because it's actually behind, I think, the, the orange line in many cases. So when you don't see the red line, it's this orange line behind it because they're the same. The red line was case one. Four millisecond sampling interval, eight levels. If you compare the red line with the others, I think you'll see that it's further away from the blue one, especially at this point. 
It's a long way away from the blue one, but the others are much closer at that point. And similar at this point, it's not so accurate compared to the others. The others follow the blue one a little bit closer. So I may conclude that the red one is the least accurate representation of the input analog data in this case, case one. Case two and case three, it's hard to tell the difference. There's not much difference between them. In fact, again, a lot of overlap. All right, the green and the orange ones differ a little bit here. The orange ones may be a bit closer, but at different points they differ, but here they're overlapping. In fact, visually it's hard to tell the difference between case two and three. But maybe you'll see the purple one, case four, is again a little bit closer to the blue one compared to the first three. For example, at this point, the red one is actually below these two. Case one, two and three come down here. The blue line is here, the purple one is the closest. Now this is just approximating, but if I hope you can see that the case 4 is the better approximation of the blue line compared to the first three cases. It's a more accurate reproduction of the original data. It will depend upon what is the input as to how close they get, but in general what we can uh, uh, observe or what we'll uh, discover is that the more levels you use and the more sampling or the more samples you take, the more accurate you'll get in reproducing the original input. So if we went up to 32 levels and we sampled every half a millisecond, would get even closer to the blue line. 64 levels, sample every 0 0.1 milliseconds, then we'd be even more accurate. We use a million different levels and we sample every nanosecond, then the reproduced data will be very, very close to the blue one. You may not be able to see the difference. In fact, the blue one is just when we have an infinite number of levels and an infinite number of sample points. That's what we get for a continuous line. So, more samples or smaller, smaller sampling interval, more samples in the same time, and more levels gives better accuracy. What's the problem? The more samples and the more levels, the more bits we need to send to represent that same input analog data. In all cases, it's the same data. Let's say it's the voice. It's the same voice that we're reproducing. But as we increase the number of samples and increase the number of levels, we need to transmit more bits to represent that same analog data. And that's the negative or disadvantage. The, the previous slides have some calculations, but they're summarized. Uh, actually, we'll jump back just to see the calculation. Case one, at least. For case one, we sampled every four milliseconds. With eight levels, we, re we produce three bits per sample. So we get three bits per four milliseconds. Every four milliseconds, there'll be three bits to be transmitted. That equates to 750 bits per second. So with case one, to represent our data, we need to transmit 750 bits per second. Case two, we sampled every two milliseconds. We still had three bits per sample. So if we sample twice as often, then we'd need to send at twice the speed, 1,500 bits per second. And uh, one of the later slides summarized the values of how much we need to send at. And we'll use that to explain the trade-off. In case one, we need to send at 750 bits per second to transmit our analog data. 
In case two, we went up to, well, we, we halved the sampling interval from four down to two, so we double the number of bits per second needed. Case three, we had four bits per sample, so it equates to 2,000 bits per second. In case four, we halved the sampling interval again to get 4,000 bits per, per second. Lower is better here. This is what many people get confused about. This is not data rate of a link. This is what I'll call, to send the data, this is the data rate we require to deliver that data. You can think about it if I have a link, I've paid for a link, and the data rate of that link is 3,000 bits per second, then if I use the sampling interval and the number of levels of case 1, then of that 3,000, I would use 750. And the rest will be available for use for other uses. But if I use case 2 of the 3,000, I would use 1,500 bits per second. I would require that amount to send my same analog data. Case 3, 2,000 bits per second. I couldn't do case 4. If my link supports 3,000 bits per second, but I must send at 4,000 bits per second, I cannot do it. My capacity is less than what I require. So the point here is that this is not data rate of a link. This is the data rate we require to send this data. So we would like to require as small as possible because it's still the same data. Case 1 is best when we compare the data rate required. Case 4 is the worst. But case 4 was the best in terms of reproducing the analog data accurately. We say in the accuracy or the quality of the reproduction, case 4 is the best, case 1 is the worst. We can see that visually here. There's more uh, accurate ways to measure that. And that represents our trade-off with sampling and, and PCM. More, more samples, more levels, better accuracy, but the more you must transmit, the higher the data rate required. And that's the negative. To send analog data as digital signals or even analog signals, one common approach we use is we digitize that analog data, convert it to digital data, and then send that. And we previously looked at using pulse code modulation, PCM, to do that conversion. So let's just uh, recap on what we know about PCM. We went through an example. In this example, on this slide, we have our input analog data, the solid line, and with PCM it's very simple. At regular intervals, record a sample. That is, measure the level, the magnitude of, or the amplitude of the input analog data, find out the actual value, and then map it to a discrete value, which we call one of the levels. In this picture, it's shown, the levels are shown as code numbers. So in this case, there are 16 levels from 0 to 15. But record at each sample point the amplitude of the input analog data, map it to one of our predefined levels, and those levels are then mapped to a binary value. With, for example, 16 levels, we need 4 bits per level to represent one of the, a number from 0 to 15. And we do that every sample point, and we get our digital data. And that's our representation of our analog data. And the two main trade-offs that we care about with PCM and other techniques like this is when we send that digital data to somewhere, or maybe we save it on disk, and then need to reproduce the analog output, how good is that reproduction? What's the quality or accuracy in which this digital data can be used to reproduce the analog input? And we saw through examples 
in the previous uh, lecture that when we reproduce, a simple way we can look at it is that we produce a, a step type wave. We step up depending upon on the level. And to get an analog output which is as close as possible or, or closer to the analog input, the two things we can do, do to increase the accuracy, we can have more samples, take more samples, means we get more granularity on the horizontal axis. And we could have more levels. We get more granularity on the, the vertical axis. So more levels and more samples will allow us to get an analog output closer to the original input. So that's another way to think of that. The more samples, the more levels, the higher the quality of the reproduction. But the trade-off here is that the more samples, the more levels, the more bits that we will get for the same amount of input. And the more bits we need to represent that analog input, that, that is a disadvantage because we either need to send more bits across a link, or if I'm saving this on my hard disk, I need to use more space to save it. So we'd like to use as few bits as possible to represent this data. Few samples, few levels to use less bits, but more samples, more levels to get better quality. And that's the trade-off that we need to deal with is uh, somewhere that gives us an appropriate number of bits for the quality that we want to achieve. We'll go through one more example of this, so it's some practical example, but before that, so we need, we need a, a sampling interval that's going to be appropriate and the number of levels. It depends on the analog input. Maybe voice requires different than music and requires different from a other analog inputs. For the sampling interval, we often talk about the sampling rate. How many samples per second? So if the sampling interval is one millisecond, every one millisecond we take a sample, then we say the sampling rate is 1,000 samples per second, or we say it's 1,000 hertz, 1,000 times per second. Now, what is a good sampling rate? For, for the moment, forgetting about the number of levels, or assuming we have an infinite number of levels, what is a good sampling rate? Well, there's a theorem that tells us what the optimal sampling rate should be. It says if our input analog signal, here it's denoted f of t, but our input analog data, remember any analog signal can be represented as a set of summation of sine waves, and each of those have a frequency. So our input analog data has a set of components from some lowest frequency component up to some highest frequency component. So the signaling or the sampling theorem tells us if we sample at a rate higher than twice the highest signal frequency of that input analog data, then when we reproduce, we can get a perfect reproduction of the input anal analog data. What does that mean? Let's take voice as an example. Voice is the input analog data. The human voice ranges in frequencies from a bit larger than zero hertz up to about 4,000 hertz. So the maximum frequency component is, let's say, 4,000 hertz. No one speaks with a frequency higher than 4,000 hertz. So the highest signal frequency of our input is 4,000 hertz. The sampling theorem tells us if we sample at a rate two times that, at 8,000 samples per second, then if we had an infinite number of levels and we reproduce from the sample data, the analog output, we'll get a perfect reproduction. So it gives us a guide of what the sampling rate should be. Another way to think of that, if my voice goes up to 4,000 hertz, if we sample at 8,000 times per second, 
we will get good reproduction, good quality at the output. If we sample it 10,000 times per second, we will not improve. 8,000 is enough. That's a, another way to, to use the sampling theorem. Twice the maximum frequency component is sufficient to accurately decode and get the original data back. 10,000 is no better than 8,000 samples per second. 100,000 samples per second, very short sampling interval, does not improve compared to 8,000 samples per second. It depends upon the maximum frequency component. 6,000 samples per second is worse than 8,000 samples per second. We should try to get up to two times the maximum frequency component. Less, and there'll be uh, a degradation in quality in the reproduction. So if we have music, for example, what's the range or the maximum frequency component of music? Music has a wider range of frequencies than the human voice. What's the maximum frequency component? It's probably somewhere in your lecture notes. Maybe the one of the very first lectures. Anyone remember? You listen to music, an orchestra or a band or something, what freak, what's the highest frequencies that music will typically produce? I think in one of our first lectures we had a plot of analog data and digital data and music typically ranges up to about 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz. So different instruments can have very high frequencies compared to the human voice. So music, let's say the maximum frequency component is 20,000 hertz. That tells us if we want to record music and save it in a digital form, we should sample at two times that rate, at 40,000 hertz. That's what the sampling ther theorem tells us. If music goes up to 20,000 hertz, sampling at 40,000 hertz is sufficient to, to get uh, accurate reproduction. Less than 40,000 will produce lower quality reproduction. More than 40,000 will not change the quality. 40,000 should be sufficient. So it depends upon the input analog data as to what sampling rate we should use. We don't have to use that sampling rate, but it's just giving us what, what we could use to get the optimal quality. This actually assumes we have an infinite number of levels, which we don't. In practice, we have a finite number of levels. So what's a good number of levels to have? Again, it depends upon the input. With voice, when people have done experiments, especially for phones, not necessarily mobile phones, but home landline phones, then to get good quality voice reproduction, the suggestion is that you have 128 levels. So instead of 0 to 7 or 0 to 15, you have 0 to 127. And when you sample, you map to one of those 128 levels. With 128 levels, it means 7 bits per level. So a recommended value for, for sampling voice to get good quality reproduction is you sample at 8,000 times per second because human voice doesn't go above 4,000 hertz, and we sample it twice that, and we have 7 bits per sample, or 128 possible levels. Sometimes we'll extend that to 8 bits per, sa per sample. 8 bits is a nice number because it's the same as a byte. So often we'll see voice, we talk about 8 bits per sample, and 256 levels, still 8,000 samples per second. 8 bits per sample at 8,000 samples per second, 8 times 8,000 is 64,000 bits per second. Good quality voice streamed across the network using PCM, you need to send at a speed of about 64,000 bits per second, 64 kilobits per second. If you want to get music in there as well, then you need to consider that music has a higher range of frequencies than voice. So, for example, if you wanted to stream uh, a radio station across the internet and there was only talking, it was a talkback radio station, no music played, very boring, but still only talking, uh, 
then if PCM was used to encode, then to get very good reproduction, you could stream at 64 kilobits per second because that allows us to take the input voice, sample at 8,000 times per second, 8 bits per sample. All right, We could use 7 bits, but it doesn't change much. 8 bits per sample, it's the one byte, and that's equivalent to 64,000 bits per second, and send that. The receiver that receives it, when you receive that stream at 64 kilobits per second, your computer converts it back to analog output and plays it on your speakers. And it should be good quality because we've sampled at sufficient rate and the sufficient number of levels. That's if you use PCM. There are other codecs, not just PCM, that will allow effectively to compress that information, reduce the size, but give almost the same quality. So you don't have to go up to 64 kilobits per second even. One last example. Uh, I'll bring up a recording of a voice again. I'll open some recorded voice in a, in a sound editor and we can see the, the audio. So this is five minutes of recorded voice in this case, audio, and it's just the showing that input or that analog data in the time domain. So from zero up to five minutes here and we see the variations of the amplitude over time. What this, in fact, is, is the software has, is taking the digital representation of this audio, the zeros and ones, and creating this plot to show us what the analog output would look like. This is just me loading up a file on my computer. So it's the digital form of the voice, but viewed uh, from what it would look like in terms of analog reproduction. If we zoom in on some parts, and we keep zooming in a bit, we see it's, this is our analog data. It uh, looks like a, a signal. It's effectively, if we break it down, a summation of sine waves of different amplitude, phase, and frequencies. It's more complex than the ones that we've seen, but you can see some variations uh, there. We keep zooming in. In fact, what the software does is that it takes the digital representation of this audio, which is the set of samples. If we keep zooming in, we'll start to see. In fact, there's just a set of sample points, the dots. So I've zoomed right in. Each dot represents one sample. This analog data was sampled using PCM, pulse code modulation, and at a rate such that if you look at the time scale, each dot here is a particular sample, some binary value, which tells us the, the level on the vertical axis and the time on the horizontal axis, and then here's the next sample, and the next sample, and so on. So you could actually map them back to the, the binary values. What the software does to make it look nice is joins the dots. So it looks like a solid line, but actually it's just sample points that's saved in the file. The software just joins them together. How big is the file when I save it? So here's five minutes of audio. How big is the file when I save it on disk? Anyone want to calculate or estimate? Guess? To start, how, do, how big do you think it's going to be when I save it on disk? Five minutes of, of me talking. 500 gigabytes. 500 gigabytes. Okay. 
500 kilobytes, that sounds a bit better. 500 gigabytes, my disk is not that big, okay? 500 kilobytes. Anyone else? It's not a bad guess. Anyone else? Three megabytes, five minutes, three megabytes. Yep. 200 megabytes, okay, so we have three values. 500 kilobytes, three megabytes, 200 megabytes. We can calculate it. It's using PCM, but we need to know two things. We need to know the sampling rate that was used. So this is a recording. For when I talk, the analog input, the computer sampled at a certain rate, and each sampled sample was mapped to one of so many levels. So we need to know how many levels. And I forgot to set it, uh, but I think I checked before in the format, it's actually 16-bit PCM. And it's hard for you to see, but the sampling rate is 44,100 hertz. That's the sampling rate. Every second, there are 44,100 samples. And every sample is mapped to a 16-bit number. So the number of levels is 2 to the power of 16, 65,000 levels in our vertical axis and 44,100 samples per second in the horizontal axis. Now find the file size. Calculate how big the file is. So we have, I'll write down the information you can calculate. We have five minutes of audio. We're using PCM. And the sampling rate, 44,100 hertz. So when I recorded the audio, the, the software was set to sample at that rate. And each sample was 16 bits long. How big is the file when I save it on disk? How are you going to calculate? Very easy. 44,100 samples per second. Each sample is 16 bits, so then how many bits per second? 44,100 times 16 bits per second. Uh, recorded on disk. How many seconds? 300 seconds. Five minutes times 60, 300 seconds. Just multiply and we'll get the file size in number of bits. We sample 44,000 times per second, 44,100 hertz. Every sample is 16 bits long, so that's the number of bits per second. How many seconds? Well, we have five minutes, 60 seconds per minute. <coughs> Why am I missing? Wrong key. I'm having problems with my keyboard. Start again. That's the number of bits for five minutes of audio. And now let's convert to bytes, divide by eight, because file sizes will see recorded in bytes. 26 megabytes. Who was closest? All right, not many people. Someone said 3 megabytes, someone said 200 megabytes. Well, maybe somewhere in the middle. 
26 megabytes is the file size. 26.46, 26,460,000 bytes to save that audio. Twenty six megabytes about. Let's confirm. I've saved the file on disk. Let's see the actual file size. It's a, the format of that file. The codec was PCM. The way that we save the data on disk, we use the format referred to as WAVE, the WAVE format. So the extension is .wave, W-A-V. Here's the file size in bytes. 26,460,144. We were close. We were 144 bytes off. Well, because the wave format adds a little bit at the front to tell us the exact structure of this file. So it takes the 26 million bytes of actual audio, plus it adds 144 bytes at the front of the file to say this is a wave file using PCM uh, encoded data. 26 megabytes. When you save an audio file, what format do you use? Or what codec do you use? I think we said yesterday. Some of the different codecs. Instead of PCM, what could you use? How do you save music? What do you use? T to save music. MP3. Anything else? FLAC. WMA. And many others. Okay, there are different codecs and/or formats. Be careful. There is two different things. The codec is how do we convert the analog to digital, like PCM is a codec, MP3 specifies a codec. But also, there's how do you save that data on your disk or in a file. So there's also there's a format. Sometimes they are the same. So MP3 has a codec, and you'll see the extension .mp3. Here we have a PCM as the codec. The format is WAVE, but often that's not the case. Let's save that file, or that, that audio, in different codecs. It's actually saved as a WAVE file at the moment, but I can export it to a different format. First MP3. And then I'll do again to FLAC. And there are many other formats okay, for different systems or codecs. If we open them, those now I have three files, .wave, .mp3, .flac. If I open them up, they'll look basically the same. And if you play them, they'll probably sound about, about the same. There may be some very subtle differences, but in, I think in this case, your ears will not pick them up very well, especially if we use this audio system. But let's look at the file size. The WAV file was 26 megabytes, the MP3 is 4.8 megabytes, FLAC is 13 megabytes. Same original analog data, using different codecs to, to sample and to save in binary, we get different file sizes. That is, we need a different amount of data, a uh, number of bits to save that uh, input analog data. WAV is the biggest. FLAC is then about half of that. FLAC refers to lossless compression. 
It really compresses the wave file because there are certain patterns in that PCM encoded data that can be replaced with smaller bits, smaller patterns of bits. That's what compression does, really. It looks for some patterns in the input. Instead of saving that pattern that may repeat many times, it saves it with a smaller special code so we can have fewer bits to, to rep represent it. So that provides compression in the same way that zip compresses your data files. You take a, a text file, you use zip or RAR or, or another uh, uh, compression algorithm to compress. When you decompress, you get the exact same data back. If we play back the FLAC and the WAVE, the quality will be identical. They'll have the exact same original sequence of bits. So the quality will be the same. MP3 does a little bit different. It compresses, but it throws away some of the original data. So when you play it back, the quality in theory will be lower than the WAVE and FLAC files. But in practice, often the quality is hard to distinguish by our ears. It depends upon different parameters in the input. So we make a trade-off between the quality of the playback, which one will be higher quality, and the file size. We want small file size and high quality. So there are different trade-offs to consider. Similarly, if you want to stream across the internet your audio, the codec that's used, different codecs can produce higher quality but will require more bits to be sent in the stream. So that's why we want to keep the number of bits small so we don't consume so many resources. It's not our intent to study the other codecs, just a, a, an example there. This software, that, or the software that I use to record the audio, by default it uses PCM and it uses 16 bits per sample and 44,100 hertz, 44,100 samples per second. Why does it use 44,100 samples per second? What's the significance of this number? We said with voice, voice ranges frequencies up to about 4,000 hertz. The sampling theorem tells us if you want to record voice, you only need to sample at about 8,000 hertz, twice the highest frequency. But here we're recording at 44,000 hertz. Well, we said before, music. Music contains frequencies up to about 20,000 hertz. So the common standard is to sample just uh, at slightly above that and double. So the, the standard is 44,100 hertz because assuming music contains frequencies less than 22,000 hertz, the sampling theorem tells us sample at double the highest frequency component. So that's why we use by default 44,100. If you buy an audio CD how much music can you fit on an audio CD? Not a one with MP3, but the original audio CDs. How many minutes of music can you fit? About. About one hour. A little bit more than 60 minutes. I think you can fit maybe 70 so minutes on an audio CD. How much data, how many megabytes can you fit on an, a CD? more than 500, about 700 megabytes, 750 me megabytes. Okay, so a CD in terms of data has about 700 megabytes, in terms of audio about 70 minutes. The standard format for encoding audio on a CD, it stores in digital data but the audio is analog, it uses PCM at 44,100 hertz, 16 bits per sample, the only difference is the audio on a CD has two tracks. It's stereo. There's a left and a right audio track. So you can do the calculations and see that with about 70 minutes of music at 44,100 samples per second, 16 bits per sample, 
and times by two because you have the left audio and the right audio, then that equates to about 700 megabytes if you want to save that on a disc. So that's why an audio CD fits about 70 minutes of music. You can calculate the exact number. It uses PCM. But if you buy an audio CD that has MP3 encoders files, you'll get much more, many more minutes of music saved on that same amount of disk space. Any questions to finish our topic on signal encoding techniques? 